Kintsugi Heroes brings you the following flood resilience stories in partnership with Singleton Neighborhood Center and grant funding from the Hunter New England and Central Coast Primary Health Network. To find out more about this podcast, head to kintsugiheroes.com.au. On July 6th, 2022, the worst flood in 70 years hit the town of Broke and the surrounding Hunter Valley region. The community is still recovering from the trauma the floods brought, destroying their homes and their livelihoods. In this special limited series of Kintsugi Heroes, John Millam sits down with the community who suffered as a result of the floods and gives them space to share their adversity, resilience and compassion. It's only through connection and empathy that there can be a path to recovery. These are stories of trauma and can be confronting. If you find they have a triggering effect, please reach out to someone who can help keep you safe. Now listen in as John takes you beyond the deluge with Kintsugi Heroes. And welcome everybody out there to another episode of Kintsugi Heroes, our f- stories of manner. And this is the flood series, you know, talking about stories of the broke and uh, Wollombi floods in 2022. And today we're very pleased to be able to welcome Karina Moonen to, um, to the conversation. So thank you, Karina. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And, and today, um, Karina, we heard from your husband, Leith, and, and you guys were at Walkworth, which is a little bit out of the, uh, you know, out of the area that most people are associated with being impacted by that. Uh, 2022 flood. But of course, the impact on you guys was devastating and it went all the way through, you know, in what was a very rapid transition. So why don't you, uh, just to to put some context around it, would you like to just share a little bit, a bit about yourself and what uh, your story leading up to the, to the 5th of July? Yeah, we were just a standard bunch of people. Lisa and I have always worked. I was an educator at a preschool for 16 years and um, was in early intervention before that. And yeah, just cruising along. We'd had a few dramas leading up to the flood. But yeah, just regular people cruising along, living our life. Beautiful. And of course, it's a beautiful part of the world there. Just for the people at home, you want to tell us a little bit about um, where you live and uh, and maybe why you live there? We live in an old school at, at Walkworth. Um, we moved to Walkworth. We actually live next door. Um, we moved out here when my son was 18 months old and he's 27 this year. Wow. Yeah. So we moved into the school and just, just loved living here. Such a, you know, such a great spot. My husband plays the drums, so nobody really wants to live too close to us. <laughs> so just great. We've got the river down behind us. Have dogs, got an only child, so always had pets. Just regular people. So regular people in a beautiful part of the land. Of course, the school you say an old school. It's a very old school, isn't it? It is a very old school. Yes. So it's a heritage building. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful spot. With our our closest neighbours are uh, the coal mine. They make as much noise as we do, so it just works out perfectly. <laughs> Fabulous. And of course, you mentioned the brook uh, nearby, so it's quite close. So, you know, flooding wasn't unknown to you, was it? No. So it spilled over into the, we've got a park in front of us, spilled over into the park numerous times over the years. And to be honest, it was entertaining because, you know, days off school, couldn't go to work. We'd hang out as family and watch the water come up and watch the water go down. It was never, I'd never, had considered that we would flood as such. So leading up, it had been raining and there was a lot of, you know, uh, water around leading up and, of course, minor floods in March. But leading up to July, the 5th of July, did yeah, and you said you hadn't considered it coming up. What was it like watching the water? I had gone to bed the night before, very blasé, going, we've been here for over 20 years. Hmm. It's come up into Hmm. the park, never had to worry. So Leith was keeping an eye on it, and to be honest, I thought he was making a fuss about nothing. <laughs> and he, he came and woke me up, and he said, oh, I think you should get up. 
you know, I think this might be something. And I still scoffed at him and went, you, you know, and Lee sort of said, you probably should pack a bag, you know, you need to go. And that was when I looked out the front steps and thought, oh, it is actually coming quite up. It sort of came around us, which I wasn't expecting. Mm. So I clearly didn't take it seriously because the bag that I packed was um, I never travel anywhere without a book. Mm. So I packed a book and a spare book just in case, (laughs) a pillow, a blanket, my medication and my handbag, back to the dog. And as we've gone to step off the top step, the dog sort of walked and I've gone, no, no, we'll be fine. This is what we're doing. So I stepped off the top step and and stepped into the water and it was above my knees and I hadn't considered how cold the water would be and how much of a push it would have. Wow. So uh, at the front of our house, we've got a big concrete slab and then a concrete path. So in my mind, I've gone, as long as I keep to the path, we'll be fine. So off we've gone, dogs all but swimming. And she was not very happy. <laughs> um, and I stepped off the path. So you, so I've dropped down about that much. Mm. And that was when I really felt the pull of the water and didn't, wasn't panicking, but I was a little bit, oh, you know, this is something. Yeah. Um, and yeah, got put up on the side of the road and still didn't really think too much of it. There's people here getting both cars and everything out. My car was out. Mm. And then, and continued to take photos, had a bit of a joke, didn't really take it too seriously. And then once I saw that it had come in through the lounge room, which is the highest point, that was pretty much the last photo I took. That was when I went, oh, it's in. Now, you know, that, that sort of changes things a little bit. Yeah. But before I'd left, Lee had said to me, you know, you probably should get yourself organised. And I had said to him, we don't need to worry. Someone will come and tell us what to do. So I had complete faith in emergency services. That somebody would come and either get us out or, or give us some sort of information. But nobody came. Whereas when we went through the fires, which were a distance from us, mm. the RFS called in, said, be prepared. So I was above and beyond prepared for the fires, cars packed, houses packed, everything's organised. For this, I didn't ever take a phone charger. Wow. Because I, I I, just thought somebody would come and tell me what to do. So we moved up onto the hill on the side of the road with the cars. I didn't even take a spare pair of shoes. So as soon as I put my shoes on, I've taken a step forward and stepped in water. Mm. So I had wet feet for the next yeah. God knows how long. Yep. Yeah. So. And that was it. We we slept in the car. As soon as the water dropped the next day, we came in and it was just awful. Yeah. It was just yeah, knee high all the way to the house. We sort of focused on the house itself. Yeah. So Leith and, and another bloke are pulling up carpets and all this sort of stuff. And I'm walking around because, you know, you keep all your child's stuff yeah. through their schooling and all the rest of it. So it was all underneath the bed. And it was all ruined. So all of that stuff that you keep from your children, for me, I am a child, was just destroyed. Your baby book, photos, just all of those things. Books, just things that meant nothing to other people. Mm. But for me, they were just irreplaceable. That's all very upsetting. But then you've got a variety of people coming onto the property saying, what do you want us to do? And me going, I've got no clue. It's, and it's still raining. It was still raining. So we're trying to save things that you couldn't dry. You couldn't do anything with. So anyway, we stayed here for two weeks. Mm. And then um, Lee said, we can't stay in the house anymore. We're homeless. And I went, oh, didn't love the idea of that. No. That you? No. So we, Lee borrowed. Um, a camper trailer from his auntie, popped it out the front. The dog's too old and fat to get up onto the bed and my <laughs> back was too bad. Mm. So the dog and I camped for a couple of weeks on an air mattress on the wow. floor of the camper trailer. Wow. Yeah. That's bloody cold. Yeah. About 4 a.m. Really quite chilly. Well, it's middle of winter in the Hunter Valley. It's not known <laughs> as a tropical space at that time, is it? And it was a bit, yeah, it was a bit chilly. Mm. So... 
after the first week of the fight, I actually got a stomach bug. Mm. So we, I'm camping with a stomach bug in the middle of winter, trying not to complain, no point whinging. Mm. The real estate was trying to organise me somewhere to go to get off the property and we found a house out in the middle of nowhere and I've just said, you know what, it's fine. And and the real estate in the coal mine really did help us out. Yeah. After about, so we'd been in the house for two weeks, been in the camper trailer for two weeks. The house up on the hill was ready. Lee said, when you're ready to go, go. And I said, no, I'll stay with you. And then I just got too sick and I ended up going, you've got to get me out of here. Yeah. So Lee drove me up to the house at night time and dropped me off up there. And it was a house on a hill in the middle of nothing. No people, no cars, nothing. So I've gone, no, we'll be fine. It's me and the dog. We'll be good. As Lee's going to leave, he's bogged up to the axles in the driveway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was supposed to be up there for three months, 12 weeks. Everyone said, 12 weeks, you'll be fine. Mm. Just couldn't take my car up there. So I went, yep, that'll be fine. No, nope, I've not lived on my own before. 12 weeks, it went from I moved out of here in August mm. and I didn't move back till March. Yeah, wow. Yep. But, of course, that uh, you talk about getting sick. Um, and spending two weeks, uh, that was a biohazard. So, you know, the the floodwaters were not clean river water, was it? Oh, no, no. It was um, it was not mud, what we were playing with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we just, I had no clue of what to do. So, you know, the old people that, you, that say just clean everything up, everything, it, you know, give it a clean, it'll be fine, which I think in some cases is true. But our whole septic had gone through the house. Yeah. And not just our septic. It was, you know, yeah. everything that had Everything come downstream, yeah. Yep. So uh, three months I, I had a stomach bug for. Yeah, wow. Once I was up on that hill, there was no coming down. So there was no going to the doctor or, you know, I got to go to the dentist. Right. So what, that's because, what, the, this house was an old um unused, unoccupied house that was available for you to stay in and just in the bush. So you were, you know, quite rustic, really. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, rats and snakes and bees and, yeah. Quite the adventure. Well, amazing stuff. Of course, at the, you know, you were there t- two weeks, cl- you know, cleaning up. You know, because you're in Workworth and just outside of the, the sort of area, the operational zone, yeah, you know, were you getting you know updated? I know people in Broke were really happy with the level of communication, but was that trickling over to you? No, no, it was. We just it was like we didn't exist, and then all of a sudden, word must have spread, and then we started to get a lot of, you know, the army, the fireys, yeah. you know, a variety of people. Yeah, but it was, it was a lot to to sort of. It was a lot to deal with that. Yeah. Because they would ask me, what do you want me to do? And I think I have got no clue. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. So now you've gone through it. Have you created a checklist in your mind, right? So you've now got, you know, fire, a fire checklist. Do you have a flood checklist now? When it started raining again, and we are supposed to be getting a lot of rain in the next couple of days, and I know the chances of that much water, again, is slim. Hmm. Um, I did walk around the house yesterday and think, like, what will I do? Yeah. And to be honest, I don't think I could start over again. I think I would just walk away. Wow. So the, is that because of everything you lost or the work involved? What what changed for you? All of it. It, was, it wasn't just I found people's perception of it upset me a little bit. Just in that people would go, it's just stuff, you know, everything's replaceable, but some things are not replaceable. Yeah, very true. And um, probably the thing that sticks in my mind the most is we had to put everything out the front for the council to come and clean up. And I happened to be home when the council came to to take that stuff away. And the sound of the breaking glass. Oh, yeah. You know, as they scooped everything up to put it in the garbage, that I really stuck in my mind because it's not rubbish. That was essentially my entire life. Yeah. Wow. What does that 
you know, what does it feel like to, to pile up your life in front of your house? It, it's sickening. It's, it, it's sickening to you, you know, to the bottom of your stomach. You, you're throwing away photos because you just, you know, or, or, you know, just all those precious things that you hang on to. Yeah. You know, and for me, I'm very sentimental. So I am that person that has kept every single card that I have ever been given in my entire life, mm. preschool photos, you know, birthday cards and Christmas cards that your children make you. I keep all that sort of stuff. You know, um, our little dog had passed away not long before the flood and we'd taken, I had taken prints from my dog because we were all going to get that tattooed and that's gone. And although that might be really small things to people and not valuable, mm. they have no, you know, to me that was just heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Throwing away your son's baby book that you've had for, you know. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. So you say but, right, and, you know, that obviously this experience has been defining for you. Beyond that but is, oh, well, I've got to keep going on. How do you do that? I I ended up not doing that. I was here trying to help Leith, but not realising that because he's still, he's still going to work. Hmm. So I'm here through the day by myself, and I didn't realise that he would be worrying about how I'm feeling, how I'm going, you know. Eventually it got to that point and Lee said, and he, he made no harm from it, it was, it's not that you're useless, it's just that you're not very useful, and he was worrying about me. Yeah. So it was around then I went, you know, perhaps it is best if I go up onto the hill and, and just get out of everyone's way. So that's essentially what I do. Sitting in quietly by yourself and the dog with you and the dog on, in, in, in a remote bushland location, that's kind of, you know, like not a usual response to, to going, you know, to healing and getting over this kind of dramatic event. Did it work for you? Initially, yes. Initially, I think I needed to get out of this situation because I was just getting more and more ill and I was, I was tired and, you know, my back hurt and all the rest of it. Um, the dog was not coping. She was starting to have a go at people. So it, it wasn't a good situation. It ended up being the most stunning solitary confinement <laughs> that I could possibly think of. Mm. I was up there for 23 hours a day by myself. I sort of saw Lee for maybe an hour, maybe two hours mm. a day. But most of that was to have a quick meal and he would have a sleep because he was just, you know, he still he was still living in the the camper trailer, trying to work as well as come up and bring me food. Yeah. So initially it worked well, but long term you forget how to interact with people after a while. Yeah. Yeah. Self imposed isolation. Well, it was, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And how do you think you're going now as a result of that? I think these things change people's personality. It changed the dynamic of my marriage a little bit. Mm. Um, Leith and I have always been 50-50 decision-making. We both work. We both, we both worked. I don't work at the moment. And it sort of went from that to... Least just making the decisions on, on my behalf, mm. which some of them were really bad decisions. Some of them not so bad. <laughs> so coming back has been a challenge. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how I fit back into things as yet. Yeah, yeah. Still in a period of transitioning back from it. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the problem is that it's coming up to two years. It'll be two years in July. So at what point do we go, you, you know, the majority of people that I speak to go, yeah, but that was nearly two years ago, onward and upward type thing. So I find that sort of thing difficult. Mm, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. So there's an interesting dynamic there, like but obviously the 
time moves on, but many of the people are still, there are other people who are still recovering or still getting back to their feet and it was a devast in what was a devastating event. How do you feel about the village itself, right? Not necessarily the people. How do you feel about the place? I had always just planned to stay here until, you know, we read the lotto and retire to the beach, really. Yeah. Now I'm not quite so sure. Mm. Yeah. After 20 odd years, that's a big thing. Yeah, it is a big thing. Yep. And it, I think the thing is when you're moving to a home and you're moving with your family, you know, you, you, you're bringing, so my son had his bedroom and all of that sort of thing. All of that's gone now. So it, it's just different. Hmm. So part of the community, the place, are the people. How do you feel about your community now? Well, so when we were up on the side of the road, yeah, I actually met all of my neighbours, yeah, which wow. I had not met them previously, um, other than a wave as you drive down the road. That's the country thing. I had never really met them. We met quite a few of them would come, I want to say, come to see how we were getting on while we were on the hill. A, a, a little while after that, um, these neighbours up on the hill, they actually brought down, they came down just to see how we were. And I had no shoes. So all of my shoes were destroyed. All of my clothes were destroyed. We were I was essentially left with the clothes on my back. Wow. Which I'd been sleeping in for the last couple of days. And a random pair of boots that I found somewhere. Uh no shampoo or conditioner, like just all of that stuff's gone. And although they're very small things, they're still things. Yeah. So we did the neighbors came down. And she just sort of looked at me and she went back home and she came back down and she gave me some money and said, please go and buy yourself some food. And I was, I was initially mortified yeah, because we're not to my, we don't ask for help. Yeah. You know, we don't take charity or, or anything like that. So it was a big thing to go instead of saying, no, no, I'm fine. I'll just wander around in songs. It's fine. I had to go. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Wow. And since then, the neighbours and us, we're very firm friends. You know, they they really, really did help us out. They fed us, basically, for, for quite a while, you know, which was incredibly kind. But I found, because there's, there were grants available hmm. from the government, so we had to go to Bulga and, you know, walk into a, into a room where there were other people like us. Hmm. But... And have to, you know, you're, you're entitled to this money from the government, sort of thing. And it was horrendous. It was just, it was. I was embarrassed and ashamed that we were in this position, mm. and that we would need assistance from the outside. But the hoops you have to go through is you have to find them your worst flood photos. Oh dear! To show. Them. Wow. So, and of course, you know. They wouldn't transfer or this wouldn't happen or that wouldn't happen. So you're just going back through these photos over and over again. And it's it, it was just it was just awful. Yeah. And and so did like at that point, right, to get that help. So you you mentioned the mines and you know, council and other people were coming in, you know, neighbors were good. So did you feel like the people were good but the system's not working? What what what's your thoughts on that? I think we just I understand why they have to make it so difficult because I, I get that there are people out there who would take advantage of the situation. But I also think that the people that are working in these sort of um, service New South Wales or whatever it is, mm. they must have some sort of feel for the people that they're, they're literally face-to-face to. And I, I don't know how they would go about it, but it needs to be a better system because it it's bad enough being there, mm. you know, it's bad enough being there having to ask for help, let alone, you know, you're just going over and over and over it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I was quite, I was a little bit bitter that nobody had come, you know, simply because if Lee hadn't been here, yeah, I would not have left. Yeah. I would have waited for someone to come and save me. So the dog and the dog and I would have been on my bed. Yeah, wow. Because that's the highest point. Mm. 
and there was literally no one coming for us. Yep. So I found that really upsetting after the fact that this had, if this had happened in a different time, if Leek had been at work, mm. or if he'd been at a gig or whatever else, I would have just sat here. As silly as that sounds. No, not at all. No. It must play on your mind, right? Do you feel like uh, this is something uh, that's still around, right? The, like you mentioned, the water's coming. How do you feel about How's that changed? How, you know? I must admit I am much more anxious when it rains now. I've always loved the rain. Yeah. But now there's just in the back of my mind going, because after the flood, we had a lot of people that came to the house that said, it's happened once. Yeah. Within a five-year period, the chances are it's going to happen again. So each time it does, this has sort of been the first, our first flood alert. So no, I have been a little bit more conscious than I normally would have been. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, and you mentioned earlier that you were, you know, had a look around of what you're planning to do. What what do you hope happens, you know, if you for the community? What do you hope the community has learnt? I think just to not forget the little people. Hmm. And it was on my behalf, it was just silly. But the alerts had come through Bulger Broke Singleton. Mm. Mm. So for some reason I've gone, Walworth wasn't named. We must be fine. Yeah. It's such a silly attitude to take, but it is what it is. And with the flood alerts that are on now, it's still the same. Right. So in my mind, I'm going, eh, it'll be fine. Can I can I just offer that don't eat yeah. You know, if it if it, uh, you know Bulgars you know gets alert, just believe it's you too. <laughs> I, I have taken that on. I'm, I have yes. Yeah, excellent. Hey, um, what do you hope comes out of all of this experience that you've had? What have you learned? Do you mean for myself? Yeah. What about what do you now know about you? I am stronger than I thought. Not physically, just mentally. Mm. Um, I am absolutely. Petrified of snakes. Mm. That was a new thing. I'm a country girl, so I've always done that. Ah, snakes are more scared than of you than you are of them. Yeah. In Browns that I had up there, there is no one more scared than me. Wow. <laughs> at that time, I learned that you've got to have a buddy. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got to you've got to keep that buddy close. Because you can't do it by yourself. So true. Who's your buddy? Well, like I think Lake and I worked that out separately. Is that as much use as we are on our own together, we can we'll make it. Excellent. Beautiful. What do you know about Leaf now? Um, that he doesn't bloody listen. <laughs> When somebody tells him to slow down and just chill out, that he just loves and adores me and the dog. And the amount of times that I would say to him, don't drive up here after work. It's late. It's raining. You're tired. We're fine. And he would still buddy show up mm. in that ute, put wood, food, water into a wheelbarrow mm -hmm. and wheelbarrow that up to me through the mud just so that we could light the fire and have something to eat. I think I admire Lee. Beautiful. How do you see, assuming that the water uh, doesn't go out and come anywhere near you today, um, how do you see the future playing out for you in and maybe the future for the area as well? I don't know. I think... I think it's always going to be in the back of our minds that this could happen again. Yeah. And that this time it could be worse. But at the same time, I think of people who have been in the Lismore floods and the Mount, you know, that were up to that, you know, that was that was worse than our situation. But I think loss is loss. And I it sure is. The, yeah. I think the one thing I have learned is that everyone's perception of what you should do or what they would do, are different to what actually happened. Yeah, you can go into it with the best plan in yeah. the world, Yeah, but we all know how the best laid plans in life work. 
and certainly you've had um, quite a number of you know opportunities to test that. So yeah, yeah. Um, looking at that whole process, uh, it's experience, you know, fires then floods, and of course the devastating impact that this event has had on you. What's it might be a bit strange question, but what what's what's something good about it? What's the best thing that's happened as a result? We've made some lifelong friends out of it. Mm. I think if a natural disaster can't destroy a perfectly good marriage, then I don't think anything can. <laughs> that's great. And I think that sometimes you're stronger than what you know. Yeah. Even if you're feeling weak and useless at the time, you're still bringing something to the party, even if it's just something small. Mm. And maybe, uh, you know, just thinking that um, it's been a wonderful chat and you've offered so much open sharing and emotion. So thank you. I've just wondered, what what's your favourite things now to do? I've always worked. So the last few years I've not been working. So my days are quite long. Yeah. I am incredibly grateful for my big buffet dog who has literally not left my side since we stepped off into the flipping water. Wow. Um, and just like, he was just incredible and continues to be. That is what I'd be grateful for. That's awesome. Thank you, Karina. Is there anything you'd like to tell the world as a result of you traveling this journey? Stick with your people. They will, they're, they're the ones that will look after you, even if they're idiots at the time. <laughs> they will still look after you. Yeah. Stick with your favourite idiots. Yep, that's exactly right. Yep. <laughs> that's beautiful. Hey, Karina, thank you so much. It's been really uh, wonderful to talk to you. And uh, I just want to acknowledge what you've gone through is amazing. And I understand that that will, you know, you still have those thoughts. And um, I think you're, uh, you're uh, very inspiring. So thank you for sharing that story. And all the best with uh, any water that's uh, head, headed your way. Oh, look, I'll be heading straight up the hill. It's fine. Yeah. You and the King Browns and the dog. Yeah. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. So, so fabulous. Thank you very much. And no, uh, all the best and we'll talk soon. Cheers. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Beyond the Deluge about the 2022 floods in Broke and the Hunter Valley. If anything in this conversation has had a triggering effect, please seek support and find someone who can help keep you safe. Please share the show to your friends, family and colleagues so we can help more people with their recovery from natural disaster. If you'd like to find out more about Kintsugi Heroes and our other podcasts, please head to kintsugiheroes.com.au. Our theme song was provided by Colin Lilly. Thanks to Matthew Bliss for editing and production and to John Millam for hosting the conversations. And most of all, thank you to the community of Broke and the Hunter Valley for sharing their lived experience with us. We'll see you next week in Beyond the Deluge. Only when you're broken Only